Um, so hi, I'm Iona from Conservation Optimism and here at Conservation Optimism we try to have a different take on conservation and the world at the moment and try and inspire people and um, promote action by um, by um, talking about the positives and taking away the story from the doom and gloom. Um, so feel free to look us up on our website. There's lots of options to get involved. If you're part of a conservation organization, you can get, become part of Conservation Now, which is a network for conservation organizations. I'll be posting the link in the comments later. Um, and just as one last reminder before we actually start, please make sure that you're muted if you're not the speaker. Um, just to make sure that um, we can't, there's no interference during the talk. Um, so today we're really, really delighted to be welcoming Dr. Katie Fawcett Williams from Wildlife Tech, who's going to be talking to us about technology for wildlife applications. So um, I'm going to let Kaylee take it away, but um, I'm really glad to see so many people here and thank you for joining. So yeah, Kaylee, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much, Iona, and everyone at Conservation Optimism for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for being here. I can see a few familiar faces and names in the uh, in the audience today. So that's awesome. And lots and lots of people that I don't know. So I'm super excited to share some of my work with you all. Um, so today, as Iona said, I'll be talking about using technology for wildlife applications, which is something I spent 19 years now I think doing um, and looking forward to sharing that with you so um, what I'll do is I'll just tell you a little bit about what we're actually going to talk about today so you're prepared um, I'll do a little, just a little bit of an introduction to myself and what I do um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about why we might want to use uh, technology for wildlife applications um, then we'll move on to what we can actually do with it um, and what what different what different things we can do with technology, um, either to better understand wildlife or to protect wildlife or often both. Um, and then I'd like to take you on a little adventure. So um, I'll say I'm not traveling quite so much these days. I don't know about you, um, but um, I'd like to take you on a little adventure to see some of this technology in action and uh, to take you to some different places to show you um, how we can use this technology. And then at the end, um, we'll have some time for questions and answers, which I think is often the best part um, to be able to actually uh, see, uh, see what it is that you are interested in, for me at least, um, and to have a bit of a conversation around this topic for those of you who are interested. So that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, I know a few of you know me, um, but for those of you who don't, I'm Kaylee. I'm Dr. Kaylee Fawcett Williams, and uh, my slides are loading very slowly, so I do apologise. Um, but I'm a wildlife ecologist, and I'm also a thermographer, which which means I'm technically trained in the use of thermal imaging technology, um, and that's allowed me to do lots of uh, pretty interesting work um, throughout uh, the years that I've been using it, uh, particularly for wildlife. So, but I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. So my mission and the mission of Wildlife Tech, which is the company that I, I run, um, is to help humans to better understand and protect wildlife so we can all thrive together. And I'm sure that all of you here will completely understand that mission, but I'd like to, like to share that with people as to why it is that I'm doing this work. Um, and why at Wildlife Tech we're working particularly with technology. So usually with technology is the way that we actually do this um, in, our, in our everyday work. So we're often helping people to learn about this technology or we're helping people to actually implement using this technology either to better understand wildlife. So they might be studying wildlife um, or they might, be, they might be counting wildlife for various different reasons, or they might be directly protecting wildlife and need to use technology to, to do that. So that's just a quick, um, quick heads up on sort of the background of uh, what, what we're doing and our, our mission. So then again, my slides are loading very slowly, so I do apologize. There should be some very beautiful pictures here, but they're not loading up right now. So. In the absence of them, I'll tell you what should be here and <laughs> see if we can get, get these. Ah, here we go. Now, they're, they're following me now, so that's good. So there are lots of different technologies that we can use. Um, I'd love it if you would pop in the comments either some of the technologies that you might have used for wildlife or you might have seen 
on the television, on the internet, uh, being used uh, for wildlife applications. It'd be good to see what you're familiar with. So particularly a lot of people I know are familiar with trail cameras. They're super affordable now um and can be put out in lots of different places to be able to capture images and even video of wildlife um drones have taken off for want of using a terrible pun over the past since sort of 2018 2019 have really massively taken a rise um in being used particularly for wildlife research um applications so that's another massive one um things like radio tracking as well you might be familiar with um, and the use of optics and um, here you'll see underwater vehicles. Um, Iona says camera traps and bat recorders. Yeah, absolutely. So do keep those coming. Liz says acoustic detectors, both static and portable. Yeah. Um, and then um, recently, actually, we were talking with some of our friends over at Nature Metrics about their work with eDNA or environmental DNA, where they're taking water samples or even soil samples, actually, um, to find DNA within the environment to be able to de detect what species um, might be around, which is a really exciting and um, interesting area, I think, of technology and using technology to help um, with lots of different wildlife uh, situations, which is really interesting. And that technology has come on massively um, in, the, in the past decade. Um, so lots of exciting technologies. I'm just going to have another quick look um, in the chat to see. Um, Oh, Melissa, good to see you. Um, she says she's just bought herself an Echo Meter Touch Pro. So that's a, a little bat detector, which I'll actually be showing you a little bit, um, a little bit. And she says for hobby, of course. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, Tamara says camera traps. Yeah, yeah. And so camera traps, super popular. And again, something that's relatively easy to use usually um, and also something that is um, is now becoming quite a low cost thing to be able to use as well so quite accessible um, for people to be able to to use um, Lauren's got one as well I know you've been finding some exciting bits with uh, with those as well and um, so yeah I think there are lots of different technologies and there are, there are so many that I could talk about today um, <clears throat> but I am going to narrow it down to, to a few. But before I do that, I want to think a little bit about why we might want to use technology um, <clears throat> for, um, for any wildlife application, really. Um, and I just saw a really interesting uh, comment comes through in the chat. So Apurva, I think, says a field spectrophotometer to record bird feather colours. Now that's a new one. That is a fantastic one. I absolutely love that. So uh, yeah, I must make a note of that. That's a beautiful, beautiful piece of technology to be able to use. But it's very important, I think, to be thinking about why we might want to use technology. And there are lots of reasons why. Um, so mainly those are to do with the, the wildlife challenges that we might have. So this depends on what kind of animal um, <clears throat> that we might want to study, <clears throat> or we might want to know more about, or we might want to protect, or any other <laughs> sort of any of those together really. Um, so different animals come with different challenges. Um, so for me, I work as many of you, some of you I know will know is I work a lot with bats. Um, bats are very challenging creatures because of course they are nocturnal. And usually I'm looking for a dark thing in a dark thing. Um, they're pretty secretive little creatures and also incredibly fascinating. Um, but they also um, you know, are in need of our help and protection as well. So it's really important that we study those species and have a good idea of what's going on with them. And to do that, we really need to overcome some of those really tricky challenges um, of looking for a dark thing in a dark thing. Um, and that also transfers, of course, not just to nocturnal animals, but also to species that are very cryptic. So we've got something here like the nightjar, which is also nocturnal, but also cryptic. So um, it has this beautiful camouflage that it uses um, to make it really difficult to be able to find um, and detect. And there are, of course, a whole range of different animals out there that develop beautiful camouflage um, for their survival. But that also makes it really, really tricky for those of us who want to study those species um, and ultimately learn more and or protect them. So we have to think about ways we can use technology to overcome some of those challenges. 
There are also species, of course, um, like we've got the monarch butterflies here that travel long, long distances. And there are, of course, a whole load more of migratory species um, that are challenging to study by the nature of their movements. Um, and so we might want to use technology to help us to be able to track them to be able to help understand their, their movements and things like that. And that can be logistically challenging. So we might want to bring technology in for that reason. Likewise, we might have animals that uh, propose challenges of living in water. <laughs> so marine mammals are one that I think of a lot um, because uh, my, my, my colleague Lena works with marine mammals and of course has to deal with all of the challenges of those. And also some of my colleagues that work with aquatic species like this, uh, this newt here, um, that can also be tricky to find. So um, the associated challenges of working with animals in water um, are another difficulty that, that we might struggle to find or to be able to find out more information about without the use or the help of technology. Now traditionally we would use to study animals uh, back in the day pre-technology or at least low technology um, the the method of direct observation. So we would be out in the field using our eyes and our ears um, to be able to look out um, for, for the creatures that we were, we were studying. And that's a very valuable skill to have, um, but it's also something that is very limited because of course, our eyes and ears don't always tell us quite the truth, um, but, and they're also very limited as well. Likewise, we have very limited attention spans. Um, we, we can only concentrate for, for very limited um, periods of time. And in actual fact, when our nervous systems put all of this information together, it doesn't always tell us the truth. So depending on what we're expecting, um, the field of psychology has, has determined that in actual fact, our brains will register things depending on whether we, we are um, pre um, sort of pre-informed one way or another as to whether to expect something. So if we expect that, say, there will be a tiger present in a particular area of, uh, of um, habitat that we're looking at, we might be more likely to report that animal using just our own senses um, than if we were told that it absolutely was not there, that it was extinct in that area. Now, that's one example, but I'm sure that you can think of, of similar examples as well, where, you know, your human senses might let you down um, and not always because you're consciously aware of it. Sometimes it can be completely subconscious, but of course we're limited as to what we can do. Our, our human senses, even if they were perfect in terms of telling us the truth, are, in, are limited in terms of um, how far we can see or hear um, and also what frequencies um, of, um, of sound or, or light that we can see or hear in as well. So, that's one of the reasons, and many of the reasons, of course, um, why we might want to use technology. So what can we actually use it for? And I'd love you to feel free to add to this because I'm particularly interested now in the spectrophotometer um, and any other interesting technologies that you want to throw into this mix. But um, what can we use it for? Well, at the very simplest level, we can use it to extend our human senses or to help improve our human senses. Um, so at the very simplest level, we can use things like optics to help um, improve an image. So to be able to see things more clearly. So this is a red kite. Um, which is luckily very common now around flying over our garden. This is actually my little girl um, with her binoculars. Um, and at the very simplest level, just looking out for things and either being able to, to um, expand on that image, help us to be able to see things more clearly. Um, and that's very, very simple, but that's one of the ways that we can use technology to help us. And of course, that's, uh, you know, hands up um, or at least um, drop me a little... Uh, a little eyes emoji in the uh, in the chat if you've uh, got your if you've got some binoculars or you would use binoculars or even a scope now to be able to just see things more clearly um, whether that's just when you're going out for fun and um, to go out in the countryside or whether it's for work um, yeah I own it yeah <laughs> I actually really struggle with binoculars. It's one of those weird facts. Um, I think it's because of my, my eyesight, but um, 
I, um, I actually use a single scope, a monocular scope, which you can see there in, in the middle of that left hand image, because um, I really struggle with, with binoculars and always have, and with binocular microscopes at universities where well, I really struggled with them. Um, but my little scope is super handy and I really like it because I can just pop it in my bag. It's really tiny, but if I'm just out and about, it's really, really handy just for looking at things. And um, for me, I might use it like just when we're looking out, if even if I'm just taking my little girl out to one of our local nature reserves or or where, when I'm out of work, it's brilliant to be able to just look at things more closely. Um, and if I, we see a bird or we see something and we just like, oh, we just want to get a closer look at that. And it sounds really simple and it is, but it's incredibly powerful, incredibly useful tool to have, however simple it might be. It's also been great for me um, for looking at things like holes in trees. <laughs> I might want to look at things that are above my height to be able to have a look at as well. But that's really the simplest way of using technology in, in so many ways and probably one of the most common, I would say. So yeah, getting lots of lots of eyes in the chat of people. Um, I love I love Katie's one. I'm sorry, Katie, I'm totally going to mention this. When I remember to put contacts instead of glasses. Yes, me too. I suffer this problem too. Definitely contact lenses for the field are an absolute lifesaver in my opinion nowadays, um, especially if we get a rainy day. Oh my goodness, I am completely useless otherwise. So another way that we can use technology is we can use it to help us see things we wouldn't otherwise be able to see with our eyes. Now that's not necessarily because it's a particular distance away like we might have with the optics. So looking for that red kite super high up in the sky. This might be because we're looking for something that's quite cryptic. And it might be because we are looking for something that's nocturnal or something that's in the dark, something that we would struggle to otherwise see. So my example for this um, here is bats, but it can be used for lots and lots of other different things. I use thermal imaging to be able to see things in the dark often, but also to be able to see animals that would otherwise be quite difficult to detect without the use of thermal imaging. So here what we've got is a thermal imaging camera set up with a laptop on the left hand side and on the right hand side we've got the top bit which I realise is black but that's what I could see um, with my eyes in this particular environment and then using the thermal camera this is an image that we generated um, from from the thermal camera and in this situation we were actually looking at um, what we call swarming which is a phenomenon um, uh, bats, um, bats do in the autumn, they gather together and is believed to be a, uh, related to mating um, and going and preparing going into hibernation. And um, they often are around in very, very high numbers um, in the early hours of the morning. <laughs> so it's, it's completely dark. And um, that's obviously very challenging. So um, to be able to see what's going on is almost impossible um, if you don't have um, any of this kind of technology or some kind of technology to help you. So that's another thing where we might be wanting to use a, a visual technology to help us see things we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. And then we've got things like tracking. So this might be where we actually want some different kinds of data. So we're not just necessarily looking for that animal. We might actually have to put some kind of device onto an animal to be able to gain more information about it. So this is an example of radio tracking. It's used for lots of different animals um, from, uh, in fact, from tiny, tiny bats all the way up to huge uh, rhinos and <laughs> things like that. So there's a whole range of different animals that radio tracking is use useful. Now, this is unlike the other technologies we've just been talking about. Yes, Jack says the bison in Kent. Yes, lots of different animals it can be used for. Now, unlike the previous technologies, this is an invasive technology, as in we do have to um, put a tag or a collar um, with the tag on it, like you can see here in the picture. Um, and it's only done under specific license with trained individuals that can do that kind of work. And it's done when there's a really clear reason for doing it. So we, we need to be very mindful about doing this um, in terms of disturbance to the animals and do, do it in, in a way that makes sense. So this is often because we want to be able to track the movements, want to look at behaviours of those of animals uh, and, and often to protect them as well. So it can be much more involved, but that's another way that, that technology is used more commonly now 
um, than previously. And the technologies, of course, are improving dramatically as well. Um, tags are getting much smaller, along with a lot of things. One of the big things with the performance of this has been battery life. Um, and uh, in actual fact, it's just improved an awful lot since I first got involved with radio tracking. So then we've got things uh, like changing our perspective. Um, so in actual fact, to um, be able to study or count particular species, it can be really, really useful to be able to get up in the air and get uh, an aerial perspective on what's going on with those animals. So um, things like deer counts where, where biologists have to cover huge amounts of area to be able to cover um, co cover enough habitat to be able to get census or as close to census counts as they can. This has traditionally been done using aircraft um, and in fact it's um, it's a pretty dangerous occupation and also quite an expensive one but that's traditionally been the way the way that's been done. But now um, we're being able to of course use drones and I mentioned drones have really become a, a big thing um, in uh, yeah, in, in studies of animals over the past uh, sort of four or five years um, and is, is improving dramatically in terms of its use. Um, drones were seen as a little bit of a gimmick um, to begin with, but I think when they're applied appropriately can be super, super useful to help us to, uh, to really answer some specific questions and particularly with things like counts and finding animals that you might really struggle to otherwise. Um, one of the limitations um, with, with drones is actually often the paperwork involved to be able to use them um, and, and having the right qualifications to be able to actually use them. In terms of actually get collecting the data once, once you're set up and you have the right equipment and, and personnel to be able to do them, actually can make life an awful lot easier in terms of, of data collection. So that can be a fantastic, uh, a fantastic tool um, in terms of... Uh, conservation and wildlife studies. So, of course, all of these technologies, um, we have the potential to be accumulating large amounts of data. Um, and as the years go by, the volumes of data that we're collecting um, as, as ecologists, wildlife biologists and researchers in, in wildlife related uh, studies, the data volumes are getting immensely bigger <laughs> year on year. And that's a real challenge. Um, it's a real challenge in terms of storing that data, um, but it's also a real challenge in terms of handling that data and turning that data into meaningful information that we can use to help understand and protect uh, the species that we are, uh, we are wanting to do that with. So there are lots of ways now that we're using technology to help us with that. So that's a fantastic thing. And also something that was absolutely necessary for the use um, in the long term of a lot of the technologies or the more advanced technologies that we're using. So um, using things like automation, so algorithms or um, artificial intelligence is one way that we can be really using the, getting the best out of our data um, without having humans to absolutely image by image process some of this information or sound file by sound file. Um, and those algorithms and processes are becoming much, much more effective and efficient, which is a fantastic thing. And I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the work that I'm doing with that in a little while. Um, so that's just a few of the main ways sort of we use technology, but there are so many more <laughs> and I, I'm not going to go into all of them today because we we have a limited amount of time but what I wanted to do was take you on a little journey I would like to take you on a little adventure to show you some of the ways that technology can be used uh, for wildlife so let me know in the chat if you're ready to go give me an aeroplane emoji or uh, or something of that ilk <laughs> in, in the chat and let me know if you're ready to go on a little wildlife technology adventure. I would uh, love to have you on board. Haha, <laughs> Jack, brilliant. I love that emoji, that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> you are absolutely ready to go. That's fantastic. Great stuff, great stuff. Okay, so, Iona. Yes, I like the bicycle, that's fantastic. <laughs> love it. Which is appropriate actually, because we're gonna start the journey actually in Cambridgeshire. Um, where I spent an awful lot of time on my bike. Um, 
going back and forwards to university departments with bits of equipment like this in my basket. Um, and the reason I was doing that was actually because when I was doing my undergraduate degree, um, my focus of um, my research, both as part of my degree, but also sort of personally um, was researching, was actually uh, behaviour in, in equids. So I was interested in, oh, Katie, that's fantastic. I'm loving the adventures there. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I was very interested in wild and feral horse behavior. So I was looking um, particularly at what herds were doing in terms of behavior, what um, animals were doing, um, inter animal interactions and behavior of feral uh, or re-released uh, horses and also uh, of wild horses as well, which I'll talk to you a little bit more. Um, but this sort of started out with some studies in Cambridgeshire. I've, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Wick and Fen. Um, I was very lucky to be given permission by the National Trust to go out um, and conduct my, my undergraduate thesis work and research work out on the Fens, which was quite a challenge. Um, to go and follow their herds that had been released onto the Fens um, for management of the vegetation and to look at how those herds were interacting um, and, and their individual behaviors. But what I wanted to do was get not just their behavior in the daytime, I wanted to get a complete 24 hour around the clock account of what they were doing. And of course that was challenging because I found myself following these herds or trying to follow these herds around on foot in the fens in some pretty difficult conditions for those of you who might have been trudging around fens um particularly those ones out there um to follow these herds it would be relatively easy you know towards the middle of the day when they were relatively quiet and calm and not doing an awful lot but then all of a sudden they would disappear off um and uh, it would be tricky to to track them down and I was very, very lucky that I talked this through um, with some incredible staff um, at the university in the lab um, and just through conversation with people um, around some of the challenges that I was having. And they said, oh, you, you, you need some night vision gear. Um, and the, the then head of the lab um, tech there went off into a cupboard somewhere and came back with um, some night vision binoculars and a night vision scope and handed them to me and said, here you go, take, take those, bring them back when you've finished with them and uh, go off and, uh, and, and use them for your night work. And I was a little bit um, taken aback by this um, and super grateful. I had no idea how incredibly expensive this equipment was at the time. Um, so I was incredibly lucky to have been allowed to use this. Um, and what those night vision um, e equipment allowed me to do was to be able to see those animals um, throughout the night, to be able to document their behaviours. And oh my goodness, did it make my life easier. Now, night vision equipment works on the basis that there has to be some low level of light. So moonlight, um, usually, um, or they'll have some kind of... Um, sort of they'll be giving out some kind of light themselves but most of the night vision is is, illumin is either illuminating or it's um it's i've lost my words now um it's using the the bare minimum of the light to to amplify it for us to be able to see so that was a fantastic piece of technology to use as part um sorry as uh, connected to that at least, I wanted to go out and learn more from the truly wild horses, um, Equus Przowski, um, which are Przowski's wild horses, which had been re-released. So, um, but they were, um, they were uh, reintroduced into Fustai National Park in Mongolia. And I managed to get out there um, for a summer to go and, and study them as well and study some of their behaviours. And as part of that, it was also helping to collect some GPS data using a device a little bit more simple than this one, to be fair, um, to be able to track the movements of the different herds, um, input that into their system so that they could better understand the movements of those herds. And that's another piece of technology we're very used to now. Of course, pretty much all of our phones have GPS in some way, um, and, and, but at the time, having a handheld GPS back then in 2003, 
Yeah, you no, know, 2002, 2003 um, was uh, not quite so common. So I was very lucky to be able to use this. But that's another way we can use technology um, to be able to help better understand wildlife as well. So after my studies, um, I became a consultant. I started working with bats. I found out about these incredible creatures. Um, in fact, after I finished my degree, I went off and uh, went to do various bits of volunteer work alongside my many part-time jobs to allow me to do that. Um, and I came across our local bat group up in Lincolnshire and went on a bat walk, which was just fantastic. And was handed a little box, not dissimilar to the one that you can see on the bottom right of this slide, a bat detector, a very basic one, um, and headed off out into the woods with a group of people I didn't know and, <laughs> and went off to find bats. And I heard over the, the speaker of this little box in my hand, these incredible clicks, almost like shotgun clicks or um, crackles on, on this machine. And I was completely hooked. I found that bats were just fascinating. And it was fascinating to me for two reasons. One was that these creatures were flying in the dark and giving out these signals to navigate their environment and communicate with one another that we could not hear with our own ears or see with our eyes, but we could eavesdrop on them with this piece of technology. And the technology was part of the hook for me because it was like, this is amazing. We can use this incredible little box to be able to find these creatures. And I just thought that was amazing. Um, and I trained for my bat license. And as part of that, learned to use various other bits of technology. And on the left-hand side, you'll see something called an endoscope. Now, an endoscope, um, th this one at least has a, has a long um, sort of flexi tube on it um, with a cable inside and a camera on the end and a little light. And that allowed me to be able to, um, to find things uh, in trees and buildings. Now we're supposed to be looking for bats, but you'll see we've got a millipede here. Um, <laughs> but it's another piece of technology that of course we can use to find things in difficult places. So that's another way that we can use technology. Um, and it's really interesting, I think, sometimes to think about some of the different technologies we can use because it, you never know. It, I might use it for bats, but you might have a, a use for this for some completely different creature. So I'd love to know if you do, uh, if you do uh, find use for any of these technologies for different species. So technology has changed a lot um, over the years that I've been working with it and I've been working particularly a lot with bats. And uh, we mentioned earlier um, the little um, gadgets that we can get now to put onto our iPhone. This is an echo meter touch, um, but there are other ones available. Um, Lauren has one of these. I think, uh, I think, I think it was Katie. Oh no, it was Melissa that mentioned earlier you'd, um, you've got one of these. So these just plug into your phone and this is phenomenal now. Um, so they use the processing power of your phone and an app that's free to download. You plug this little microphone into your phone and you have a really amazing bat detector. Um, now these are, I think they're a couple of hundred pounds at the moment, but an equivalent bat detector would be around 1600 pounds. So it's made that technology much, much more affordable, not necessarily affordable for everybody, but much, much more affordable than it ever had been before. So if you already have a smartphone, um, you could potentially turn that into a, into a bat detector. And should I say also a detector for lots of other animals because, um, you can also find lots of other creatures that make sounds that we cannot hear with these things. So uh, we were actually talking yesterday um, with our summer school students, um, Dr. Stuart Newson came to talk to us and he was telling us all about um, different animals that, that use different uh, frequencies that we can't hear, that you can of course pick up with some of these. Uh, shrews were among them, that was a fantastic one. Rats were also an interesting one as well. Um, lots and lots of different animals making some very weird and wonderful sounds out there. Insects, of course, um, things like bush crickets, lots of different animals making sounds that of course we can't hear. And we can use these kinds of technologies to be able to eavesdrop on those conversations. Some animals might be making those sounds because they're using them to uh, navigate their environment. So the bats are giving out signals that bounce off their environment and come back to them. And they use that to be able to um, 
and you use that to be able to navigate in their environment um, but and also to locate their prey um, but also can use social calls to be able to communicate with other individuals and other animals might be using um, these frequencies to be able to communicate or they might be using them to be able to navigate as well so uh, it's a really interesting field bioacoustics for those of you who uh, might not have have necessarily come across it, um, well worth investigating if you find that an interesting area. Um, yeah, Liz, that's right, Stuart is the acoustic scientist analysing all the data for the Balawick bat surfing Guernsey, he certainly is, and what an incredible uh, piece of work that is, oh my goodness, we were absolutely fascinated, yeah, brilliant, Liz has just put a link in there to the, the BTO, so you can learn a little bit more about that, it's absolutely fascinating, so if you're interested in the, the bioacoustic side of things, well worth um, definitely well worth thanks for that Liz. So hopefully my slides are now following me again, brilliant. So after I'd been working with bats for a little while I'd learned as much as I could about the technology over here in the UK, I'd learned as much as I could about the bats over here in the UK as well, I'd put myself on every course I possibly could, I'd pick the brains of every bat person I could possibly speak to um, and, and learned so much but I knew I wanted to go back and learn more. I wanted to go back to university to do my PhD research and really learn, learn more and develop my own knowledge of both the technology and the species that I was working with. So I went over to the University of Southern Denmark, um, those of you who know on the island of Foon, Denmark, and um, I was able to there work with the bioacoustics um, bat lab there and I got to use some incredible technology. So you'll see me here on the right hand side with what looks like a crucifix and yes it does. Um, this is called a multi-microphone array. It has 12 to 16 microphones on it, possibly more looking at that, um, which are very specialist pieces of equipment and also very expensive pieces of equipment that are all hooked up via that little I think I uh, was muted there. Can you all hear me again now? Somebody let me know if you can hear me all right now. I think I accidentally muted myself. Yes, sorry, sorry everyone. Hooray, <laughs> I'm back. Um, so um, I went off to do my PhD and was um, doing my PhD in bat bioacoustics. So what I was investigating was looking at how bats change their echolocation calls when they're flying together. And I looked at um, particularly Dorbenton's bat um, in Denmark and also in the UK, and also horseshoe bats in the UK and in South Africa. And I was using these weird looking crucifixes, um, which as I was trying to say, I'm not sure how much I was muted for. So I'll just explain um, lots of microphones on this array, very specialist um, microphones that register in the ultrasonic range. So above the range of our human hearing. And they're very, very sensitive microphones. So I was able to be able to get some incredibly high quality recordings of these bats and also to reconstruct their flight paths in 3D. So we could look in detail as to how they might change their calls as they were flying together. Um, so that's one of the ways, of course, that we can use this technology. It's quite a specialist way of using that technology, um, but it, it allowed me to really uh, learn an awful lot about bioacoustics. Um, and we I talked a little bit about that obviously, but from Denmark, I then went off on lots of travels um, throughout my PhD where I was able to conduct research with different species um, and different human beings as well. So this is Lena Faber, who I owe a lot of thanks to for helping me with lots of my research um, over the years. Um, Lena and I spent um, a couple of summers out in Canada working with little brown bats um, and Lena also worked uh, a lot with moths out there and using technology to, to help us study them. So you'll see here um, on the bottom left in the, in the black and white photos there's a picture of me with yet another of those crucifixes um, and also another gadget which is a high-speed thermal imaging camera. And I was using that in combination, so using two technologies together, which is another, another really important and powerful uh, way to, to do things. Um, outside some caves in Canada, um, where I learned an awful lot. Now, this was at the time when um, 
the white nose syndrome was becoming a massive issue. And I remember standing outside a cave with this technology and we were studying these bats. And I remember just thinking these could be the last of their kind. These bats were dying in their thousand. They hadn't reached the particular area that we were in. Um, and we were particularly cautious about um, being using non-invasive methods um, for at, at the time, once we the sort of the white nose syndrome was coming in. And so using things like acoustics and the thermal imaging cameras was really powerful with being able to see what was going on in terms of bats and their behavior without touching them. Um, and also it was just an amazing experience. But at the time it was really quite nerve wracking because we really did think, you know, these could be the last of uh, the last of their kind. Now, look, police have been working diligently on studying um, that and have, um, yeah, luckily things have been bad, um, but not as bad as uh, they might have uh, have been. <laughs> so um, I've also been um, using technologies like thermal imaging and bioacoustics um, around the world for some really interesting species, lots of different bat species. So I've been very lucky um, to be able to travel to South Africa as part of my PhD research where we were working with rhinolophids, so the horseshoe bats out there, using multi-microphone arrays um, and thermal imaging technology to study them. Also out in Belize, studying a bat called Rhynchonectris naso, which is a bat that has a very beautiful nose. <laughs> it's well worth looking that up. I will uh, send a picture out to those of you, anyone who's interested. Um, and also, once I came back to the UK, I also started um, working with bats again um, and was sent out to New Zealand to train a team of, uh, of bat, um, bat ecologists out there to use thermal imaging technology, which was incredible. And my most recent trip um, outside of the UK uh, was back in 2019 um, to, um, to Thailand uh, to both share some of my research with thermal imaging with bat biologists from around the world, um, but also to learn more about some of the technologies that were developing, and particularly some of the bioacoustics technologies that were developing as well. So um, technology has taken me all over the place. Um, but as many of you, of course, may have also experienced, um, a lot of my research stopped. Um, I actually made, uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I made a New Year's resolution uh, for the 2020 New Year uh, to, to not travel that year anywhere and to, to reduce my carbon footprint and, and all of that. And uh, it was much, much easier than I thought it would be in a natural fact. It grounded an awful lot of my, my research and my conservation work. But that said, it did allow me to do something different. And it meant that I actually started doing things differently in my work. So it not only allowed me to lower my carbon footprint very, uh, very quickly, um, but also allowed me to work with lots of different students um, and researchers around the world. One of which I want to give a mention to is Dr. Priscilla Mead, who uh, she came to Wildlife Tech as a teaching assistant and since I've been in contact a lot about her research with thermal imaging um, and bioacoustics and her students uh, work on this incredible creature called a Kalugo. Uh, if you haven't heard of a Kalugo, please go and have a look at them. Um, these are very tricky creatures uh, to find. Um, they are beautifully camouflaged. This image doesn't necessarily do justice to how difficult they might be to find. Um, but also quite tricky creatures to work with and Priscilla has been uh, working with thermal imaging, so say bioacoustics as well, um, to study these uh, very, very, very different creatures. So definitely one for you to have a look at if you get a chance. Uh, Lauren's put a, put a link in there for anyone who wants to learn more about Kalugos. I apologize, you may go down a rabbit warren of learning about Kalugos today, but I think that will be positive <laughs> for everybody. Um, so, I've also been doing a lot more local research, so I have uh, also now got my research permit at Oxford University's uh, Whiteham Woods, which is just an incredible place. If ever you are in Oxfordshire in the UK, let me know. Um, I'd love to go and show you the bats in Whiteham Woods. I've been conducting research there with thermal imaging um, to help change the way that we do uh, bat survey work, um, making it more efficient, uh, more carbon efficient and more cost efficient. And what's best is 
better for the bats, much more accurate and helping us to protect them in a much more efficient way. One of the ways we're doing that is using um, using algorithms to be able to automatically or semi-automatically analyze the data because while thermal imaging is an incredible technology to help us detect animals in difficult situations like in the dark or when they're very camouflaged we can end up with reams and reams of data and I can end up in front of a computer and Lauren can also attest to this has spent many many days in front of computers um, analyzing this footage and um, with uh, a project that I'm working on with a student, uh, Nick, actually, I'm not sure if Nick's here, his thesis, master's thesis project has been working on this uh, using automated technologies to help to analyze this in a much more efficient way, which in the long run will be fantastic for bat conservation and also the conservation of lots of different species as well um, going on from this. So uh, that's one of the, one of the big positives um, of, of being grounded here. But we're also helping from the UK with some international projects as well. So I've managed to get hold of some uh, some equipment that we are in the preparations of getting out to some exciting places to be able to help researchers, to be able to help other species out and about. And by doing tests here in the UK, this is actually Lauren on the right hand side. Apologies, Lauren. I've had to feature you. Um, Lauren's been doing some fantastic work with us, um, particularly with our primate work with um, WAPCO, the West African Primate Conservation Association. And um, we've been testing how thermal imaging might be useful for primate monitoring for potential future schemes of re-releasing primates into the wild. So we're using thermal imaging technologies for this. And again, some of those automated um, systems are going to really help us um, in future projects like that to be able to uh, make these uh, make this work really efficient um, and effective for conservation. So uh, this is one of those beautiful primates in a, in a tree um, for one of the thermal imaging uh, one of the thermal images that we've we've been taking in our test images. So to be able to make these automated systems work, we have to have a library of test images and um, to be able to either teach um, the the different algorithms or to be able to inform um, those uh, those bits and pieces. Um, I can't tell you where that photo was taken, unfortunately, because I'm not allowed to release all of the details of the project yet. But as soon as we do, we will be putting it out in our newsletter. So if you want to learn more, um, Lauren will um, hopefully send you a link to our, our website. And when we're allowed to release um, the full details of the research project, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, is a really exciting stage and also a really frustrating stage at the moment because I can't wait to share it with everybody. But um, we we haven't uh, we haven't got to that point, but hopefully we will. So I'm going to just about end there because um, I'm excited for the road ahead. Um, and I think the future is very exciting for the use of these technologies, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so watch this space. Do, um, do keep in touch if you're interested. Do follow us and uh, we'll keep you posted with some of the research and some of the developments with these technologies. I hope that that's been, been useful for you. So just to sort of recap in case that's been a little bit of a, a journey. Um, so I've obviously introduced myself and, and Wildlife Tech. We talked a little bit about why um, we might want to use technology for wildlife. We talked about some of the, the what's, some of the things that we could actually use wildlife technology for. And I hope you've enjoyed that little journey around the world with me on some of the ways that we can use technology, some of the ways I've used technology and some of my colleagues have been using technology um, for wildlife to better understand and or protect wildlife um, in the long run. So hopefully we have a few minutes uh, for some questions, but I want to say a big thank you to those of you who have stuck with me um, on, on that journey. And I hope that you, um, you've enjoyed that and have uh, learnt a little bit along the way. So if you do want to learn um, about any, any of these technologies we've talked about, do head on over to wildlifetech.com. We've got some resources over there, some free resources over there that you can have a look at if you want to learn a little bit more. And of course, we're either my, want to follow myself, um, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always sharing bits of information. So feel free to, to find out more over there. Um, so let me just double check and see the chat, how we're doing. 
So um, please, <laughs> thanks so much, Kaylee. Feel free. You are very welcome. Add questions into the chat or, or say them out loud. But I think there's one from Bilal already. There's are there any algorithms developed to analyze camera trap photos, especially of big cats? Or, there are or who sticks there, to some species. Yeah. The, yes. So there's been quite a lot, a lot more work actually with artificial intelligence um, and algorithms to automate the process of camera trap data. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. We have um it's completely gone from my brain now. The, the there's a fantastic online resource, and it's free online resource about it, and now it's just completely gone from my brain. But if I remember, I'll send it over to your owner. Um unless Lauren, if Lauren remembers what it is, we yeah, we spoke to some fantastic people about it last year. Um, but yes, there are lots of there's lots of that out there. In fact, there's a lot more for visual data like camera trap data than for the thermal which is why it's been a bit challenging for us because it, the, there are certain challenges with that kind of data so yeah yeah feel free people to put up your hand or put more questions in the comments but um if the algorithms are being adapted for things like acoustic or or camera trap footage how is that translating to say thermal imaging is it is it translating well in terms of being able to use these algorithms but for thermal imaging cameras so in actual fact there there've had to been some quite custom uh, custom algorithms set up um one of the ones we're working with is called through tracker which is a fantastic one um and it's completely open source which is brilliant as well um so dr aaron corcoran and his colleagues over uh, the other side of the pond um have created this incredible resource so it's well worth looking up if any of you are interested in that um it's been used for bats and birds um but that's very custom because in actual fact the thermal data has a lot of challenges in it that are unique to thermals so they've had to really do an awful lot of specific work on those algorithms for that kind of data if that makes sense yeah absolutely um we've got some more thanks from jan in the chat as well um again if there are any more questions please add them in what is your favorite piece of technology for wild applications oh my goodness that's really tricky because i'm addicted to technology as you can probably tell um i think on the whole, it's my my big thermal imaging camera. Um, it's, I use a FLIR T1030 SC, which is a, like it's the highest sort of spec you can get for like if you're not in the military. Um, it's a really amazing camera, but that's like for my big professional work. Personally, as a piece of kit that I would take all over the place with me is my little echo meter, the little bat detector that you saw that attaches to my phone because I just have it in my bag wherever I go and I just know that even if we go to a friend's house or something and you know maybe go for dinner or something it's getting dark and be like do you want to see if you've got any bats let's go see if we've got some bats you know and it's just really interesting you know what you can pick up so that's uh that's my personal favorite <laughs> yeah that, I, I have one and I love it yeah. it's it's amazing and also just you can go all over the world and yes. pick this up it's, it's amazing yeah. Yeah, and, and the different things that you pick up when you go traveling, the different things that you pick up, it's really, really interesting. Even within the UK, when I've gone to different sort of regions of the UK, it's just really interesting what you what you yeah. what you pick up with it. Oh no, absolutely. It's incredible. My favorite at the moment is the Merlin Bird ID app because that's the same. You can oh, yeah. it's incredible. There's um, some fantastic apps now and they're the development of the apps has really come on as well, I think. And that's another really accessible one for people as well. Yeah, absolutely. Shall I go with one last question? Yes, yeah, so let's have one last question. That would be I'm going to I'm going to say, what do you think the next big development in technology for wildlife applications is going to be? So. I think there's two things. There's there's one is the software and one's the hardware. So I think the biggest thing now is getting over the hurdle of testing some of the software for the thermal side of things, because we're at a point now where we've got this mass of growing data and a massive inability to keep up with it. And I think we're almost there. Um, and in terms of the UK use of it, we're almost there with with the numbers on it. And once those numbers are out there, we can start using it 
properly and really expand the use of it. So I think that's a big thing. Um, the other thing with hardware, I think, is battery life is a big thing, like the battery tech and also the battery tech becoming more eco-friendly, quite honestly. Um, so, but, you know, there are developments. The battery tech hasn't changed it hasn't come on as much as the tech world has promised it would. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm eagerly waiting for that because that will impact lots of different devices and also it really impact the way that we can use them. So it's a big thing. Really interesting insight. On that note, it's just turned 2 p.m. So we're going to end the call now. Um, feel free to check out Conservation Optimism where I've put the links in the chat. And also we'd really appreciate it if you filled in our post webinar survey so that we can have insight into what people want to hear and so that we know what to do in the future as well um, and also look out for future webinars the next one is on the 6th of september um, by mike cunningham from nine trees he's going to talk to us about um reforesting um uh, uh britain essentially Ooh, um Big blue. yeah we'll be sending out lots of uh all the resources that have been mentioned today in an email to everyone who's attended today um, as well as a bunch of links. So if you missed anything, we'll be sending them out as well. Um, so thank you so much for joining today. Uh, thanks so much, Kaylee. That was a really awesome You're talk. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Amazing. And on that note, um, hopefully see you at the next talk. So bye-bye. Have a really nice day, whatever time it is where, where you are. Bye-bye. Um, thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.